So we are delighted to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Stephen Mullen, a lecturer in history, legacies of Atlantic slavery from the University of Glasgow. In tonight's talk, Dr. Mullen will examine the Scottish diaspora in the colonial British West Indies. This presentation will illustrate the lives of Scots on three islands, Jamaica, Grenada and Trinidad, and their lives as merchants, planters, enslavers and overseers. How Dr. Mullen has researched their lives will be explained, including the use of Scotland's People website. So it's over to you, Stephen. Thank you. Well, thank you very much um, for the, the kind introduction. It's, it's, it's a real pleasure uh, to be invited to speak to National Records of Scotland uh, online lecture tonight. I mean, I've spent many, many years, many, many, many sessions in the National Records, you know, researching Scots in the Caribbean, Glasgow's colonial merchants, you know, but latterly, you know, in the publication of the book, um, The Glasgow Sugar Aristocracy, uh, I, I came to, you know, use Scotland's people as, you know, a, a, a sampling tool, uh, as well as, you know, facilitated the downloads. It gave me this big major corpus of evidence. So when in the discussions about what we should talk around, you know, obviously the Glasgow Sugar Aristocracy book was published uh, last year, but I, I thought I would I would make tonight's uh, lecture, you know, much more methodological, you know, speak about the use of Scotland's people, which is, of course, traditionally seen as a genealogical tool, but how historians can and do use it uh, in terms of these um three islands, and I focused on three islands in my book, uh, Jamaica, Grenada and Trinidad, I'll go through them and then I'll, I'll trace the lives uh, as Jessica uh, has described, I'll trace some of the lives of these Scots. So thank you very much for, for to Jocelyn uh, for the invitation as well as Jessica and everybody else at NRS who has facilitated um, this. Again, it's it's just it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here and speak uh, to, to an audience and thank you for attending too. So I think, I mean, what is the Glasgow sugar aristocracy? Um, well, we've got a number of different definitions, if you like, about what the Glasgow sugar aristocracy was. And if you look at some of Glasgow's most famous antiquarian uh, publications, particularly John Strang, uh, who is writing, he really defines them uh, in his classic publication, Glasgow and its clubs, which is published in 1857. And he sees them as quite a, a, a tightly defined group uh, uh, of it's a commercial group. So this is the West India merchants in Glasgow, the planters who obviously owned estates and enslaved people, and the merchant proprietors who were both merchants uh, and um, planters. So it's a mesh of both. And of course, these merchants, they are the commercial successors to the tobacco lords. They become prominent after the American Revolution, 1775 to 1783, they then underpin Scotland's industrial revolution uh, simply because they are, you know, they're important, importing produce, of course, sugar. Um, but they also could be called the cotton aristocracy because uh, that is the commodity they're important. It has the major effect, of course, it's underpinning, you know, Scotland's manufacturing sector, um, many cotton mills across the west of Scotland. Um, but also importantly, they're providing that in our that transatlantic commerce, you know, they're allowing these, um, the produce that is getting produced in the manufacturers, the textiles are getting sent back. Uh, so they are underpinning this, this commercial uh, relationship is underpinning Scotland's push to industrialization. Um, that's Strang's uh, definition, but there are others, and Sir Archibald Allison, who was the sheriff of Lanarkshire, uh, when he comes to Glasgow, I think in the 1830s, he he then writes later, he writes this account of his life uh, and his writings, and he sees the sugar aristocracy as quite a tightly defined group, much more tightly defined than Strang. He sees the sugar aristocracy as, as a core of elite families. I think he says there's about eight of them. And we're probably thinking there about the Smiths of Jordan Hill, uh, you know, the Bogles of Dildowie, the Campbells of Possel, you know, and he talks about some of the social network practices and how they're, they're quite a tight cast. Uh, in terms of marriage. We also know um, very prominent historians have written about, you know, Glasgow's West India merchants, Tom Devine, of course, in a, in a classic paper in 1978, 
wrote about the 18th century West India elite. Anthony Cook, much more recently, has, has written an article in 2012, Elite Revisited. But what I tried to do differently in the book, I tried to take um, a new approach. I tried to facilitate an examination of the metropole and the colonies in a single analytical frame, showing how each uh, influences the other. And I should say that Scots have, uh, some historians of Scotland and the Caribbean have examined, you know, Scots in the Caribbean, particularly Jamaica, and I'll come on to that. As, as we progress. But this new approach, the digitization of these sources that are facilitated by Scotland's people has, you know, it's made this much more easy for historians to access the material. You know, there is a searchable database uh, and, you know, we can we can really use Scotland's people. We can harness its power. Uh, I was at a lecture quite recently in the National Records and someone said that um, Scotland's people is amongst the best in Europe in terms of uh, the service of its type, the, the genealogical, uh, you know, database and resource. Um, whether it has been, it, it seems to me, it's up there. You know, I, I haven't been able to source the same sort of data for England, for example, but I'll come on to some of the reasons for that um, as well and why this seems to be fairly unique. So I think... Um, you know, I'm going to move away from the sugar aristocracy here. We know who they are. We know who the merchants are, the planters. We know who they are, the, you know, merchant proprietors are. We are specifically going to focus tonight on the merchants, uh, sorry, on the Scots who go to the Caribbean. And there was a clear mentality uh, uh, in late 18th century and 19th century Scotland where these Scots were pushed. There is the perception of fortunes uh, in the Caribbean. Slavery derives wealth. Perception of get rich quick it was an escape for many, including Robert Burns, who potentially was on his way in 1786, but ultimately did not go. Uh, it seems it's always infuriating for me as a historian of Scots in the West Indies that Robert Burns is the perennial, you know, example given when in fact he had no connection to slavery at all. He did book three tickets, but he didn't go. We will trace tonight some of the Scots who did go and the impact of their wealth. But the West India merchants in Glasgow were absolutely fundamental to this process. You know, I've talked about the processes earlier in terms of imports and exports, as well as some of their investments in, say, cotton mills. But they also had a major influence in developing a, a Glasgow West India and indeed Scottish West India labour market because large swathes of the Scottish society, usually young men, were and migrating down to Glasgow, uh, they were engaging with these merchants. The then the large ships would have left Port Glasgow and Greenock, so they operated essentially as shipping agents as well. And this is exemplified by this advert here uh, in the Glasgow Herald. You can just see, you know, this is John Campbell Senior and Co., one of the major firms uh, in late eighteenth and nineteenth century Glasgow. They're involved uh, in Tobago and Grenada, as well as Demerara. But you can see some of the, the adverts um, there that they are, you know, they are wanted to serve in the West Indies. They're pulling young men in. They need specific skills, in this case, carpentry, tile makers, uh, and other lads from the country. They want rural experience to work in the estates. And we can see this image here in Port Glasgow. I mean, this is a wonderful image, and it actually became uh, the cover of the Sugar Aristocracy book. But we can see here, there's some of the large ships, of course. The ships couldn't leave Glasgow as we know it today, so we can see some of these ships. Uh, these are the large seagoing vessels. We can see some of the hogsheads in the bottom left, perhaps felt um, the Muscovado, or perhaps these are empty. Uh, you know, either they're waiting to go on or waiting to come off. You can see at the end of the pier, you know, the people, are they waiting to go out in the smaller ships into the bigger ships? We see, you know, across... Uh, the Firth of Clyde into Argyll, you know, it's just, it's a fascinating image. And just after the slavery era itself, but it really summarises, you know, just everything going on in this period. It's very picturesque. So Port Glasgow, of course, was uh, the tobacco port, I should say, the major tobacco port. And Greenock was actually uh, the major sugar port. But I never found that image as picturesque as Greenock, uh, uh, for Greenock as I did for Port Glasgow. So that explains why it was used. So in terms of shipping, uh, this becomes very problematic for historians in that, you know, we need estimates of how many ships departed for the West Indies. 
it's problematic in that there is no official statistics before 1841. So we simply don't have, a, you know, reliable data for across, across the slavery era uh, up to 1834, when, of course, slavery is abolished in the British West Indies. Historians then, particularly Alan Carris and Douglas Hamilton, have looked at newspaper advertisements. And we can go back one, we can see this is an advert here. We can estimate when a ship would have left. They provide departure points. Historians have then went through the newspapers and compiled large databases. Uh, Alan Carris did this. Douglas Hamilton then developed a methodology from Carris's data. I decided I needed to go much later. You know, I went right up to 1834. The previous estimates were for the 18th century. I went right up to emancipation in 1834. And as we can see here, I went through one, I discovered 1,742 shipping adverts. Uh, and it just gives us some cursory estimates how many of these ships would have departed Clyde Port, Port Glasgow and Greenock for the West Indies in the late slavery era. To me, it suggests I was able to compare this data with Caris. We're able to see there's a, a, at least a cursory increase in the levels of outward shipping between the 18th and 19th century. We also know that there's uh, Jamaica as the premier um destination for Scots. I mean, that's that's quite clear from the data, even if it is shipping advertisements. Uh, Demerara and Trinidad become uh, much more important. So in terms of deciding, when I was writing the book, which was a PhD thesis at the University of Glasgow, I decided, um, you, you know, I, I wanted to split up the colonies to see, you know, how Scots would have influenced them and how in, in turn their fortunes were being influenced. So a historian, B.W. Higman, he talks about three phases of colonisation in the Caribbean. A first phase colony is Jamaica, subsumed from the Spanish in 1655. Uh, Grenada is a classic second phase, subsumed after the Treaty of Paris in 1763 after the Seven Years' War. Uh, and then into the third phase of British colonisation in the Caribbean. It could have been Demerara, it could have been Trinidad, uh, and Trinidad, I, I thought, was uh, the most appropriate choice because there, there was very little written uh, about Trinidad. David Austin has done some remarkable work in Demerara, and we'll speak a little about that later. So clearly that's why I picked the three colonies, you know, Jamaica, Grenada. I spent time uh, in, in them all, including Trinidad at separate times. Um, but we can move into, you know, we also need some estimates how many, how many people went. And again, that becomes problematic because we don't have any passenger lists. You know, there's very little reliable data. But based on uh, Douglas Hamilton's methodology, we can estimate between five, seven, and nine. Uh, <clears throat> you know, sojourners went um, from uh, Clyde Ports to the British West Indies across this period. And I've developed a methodology just providing a new estimate of Scots to the British West Indies. I extrapolated from the Clyde data uh, to Scotland overall, and I've provided a new number. But again, this can only be cursory. I mean, effectively, these are their guesstimates. We simply do not have the data to provide any reliable statistics. But this is as close as we can get, and this defines, defines current understandings. We're starting to get any more solid data. We can actually, there's again, there's very few passenger lists, but we have one or two, particularly this register of emigrants, and it provides details in Scots who left in a number of voyages from Greenock in 1774 and 1775. So what I tried to do, you know, we know from Douglas Hamilton's work, these migrants would have been typically single young men. We know they were pursuing employment. I started to look more, I started to think about regional comparisons. Uh, and I think the most of these men in these ships would have came from the Western Lowlands, which is probably not unsurprising since it was leaving Greenock. But what was surprising then, or again, it might be unsurprising, is that the Highlands North, East and the North are overrepresented compared to population size. We need to remember this is the time of the clearances as well. So when I've argued that, the, the you know, compared to population size, you know, uh, the Highland Hebrides, the Northeast and the North are, are overrepresented. And that's an important point that I will come back to. So then we start to get in. This is where the beauty of Scotland's people really uh, comes up uh, because they obviously provide very solid, very high level uh, of evidence, legal evidence around executory. 
there's a number of different models um, that historians have deployed in terms of trying to quantify slavery's profits. We can look at uh, trade statistics, uh, and that would provide a national picture. And I actually do that in the book. We can look at, uh, you know, custom records. It provides evidence of Scotland's Scottish trade up to 1827. They are an official values uh, rather than current values, meaning the prices are set uh, at the opening of the period, which is an important point because then we can start to sh we can start to compare against different colonies, uh, and we can show that there's a rise in general. I'm speaking in general here. We can see that there's a rise in the trade to the Carib uh, the British West Indies, and there's a decline in America, um, the American trades. But where historians have also differed is we can have estimates of wealth acquired uh, in the colonies, and this is the personal profits model. So that's the two models, national or personal profits. In terms of personal profits, there's been some really seminal work done over the last decade. The legacies of British slave ownership, particularly the work of uh, Nicholas Draper from around 20, 2009, 2010 onwards. I mean, this has really dramatically transformed what we know, you know, about British uh, enslavers who uh, claimed compensation when slavery was abolished in 1834. And the setting phase of that project, they, they, they evolved into, you know, uh, compiling biographies and inventories uh, of, you know, British, uh, including many Scots, who were involved across the colonies. I think the best work done on personal profits in the colonies has been done by Trevor Bernard and Christa Petley, particularly Jamaica inventories. Uh, and the Jamaica inventories are, are, are quite unique in the Caribbean. Not a lot of these records are preserved, but the Jamaica National Archives which I visited in 2014, you know, they do have, you know, you know, a lot of data, uh, a lot of source material still preserved. They don't have the, the they don't have them uh, digitized, which means that you, you know these two historians have, have done incredible work in, in, over many years on these sources. But what is much less known is not just the money that is acquired in colonies such as Jamaica, but how much of this wealth was accumulated and repatriated to Great Britain. And this is where Scottish pe Scotland's people really comes into its own. Of course, I don't need to say, we're all aware, mate, Scots were anomalous British subjects. After the Union of 1707, Scots had legal access to empire. However, uh, Scotland uh, retained distinctive aspects of civil society. It had a distinctive religious, judicial and educational system. And that judicial system opens up, uh, you, you know, uh, possibilities here because Scottish legal recording around executory is more comprehensive than the prerogative of court of Canterbury. One estimate in a genealogical book that I examined says they think about just 5% of wills and testaments in the Canterbury court are estimated to have associated inventories. I don't know what the specific proportion is in terms of Scottish legal recording, to me, it seems higher. Um, but anyway, you know, I, I, I've I've been able to identify just many more inventories that have the associated wills and testaments, and it means I can provide answers that historians of the English West Indies haven't yet answered, and Scotland's people help with that. So in terms of the process here, I mean, Scotland's people, I, I was able to identify and work on 130 inventories, and as we'll see, as we move forward, these are in Jamaica, Grenada and Trinidad, I'm going to explain the rationale. I mean, just at a basic level here, you know, they provide evidence of wealth, where these Scots died. Sometimes we get home residences. We also get, like, transmission strategies, say, well, this money's going to my mother, or, you know, uh, sometimes there's philanthropic uh, strategies. And we will uh, come on to that later uh, as well. I think there are some questions... Um, one executrix noted in 1832 that they couldn't evaluate Jamaica property, which, of course, was often enslaved people. And we can see this, uh, the first inventory that I've put here. This is him, he's saying it. The executrix is saying, well, I can't evaluate the Jamaica property. It could be substantial. I just don't know. Uh, and obviously, of course, uh, the confirmation process in Scottish courts and the commissary and sheriff courts, they evaluated movable effects, uh, of course, rather than, than heritable property. So they're limited in their scope. It's, it's an incomplete picture. And I would say that it suggests to me, I mean, there was a weak Scottish administrative infrastructure in the colonies. It doesn't seem to me that there, there were Scottish evaluators present in Kingston or, 
or elsewhere. They may have been, um, but you know, I never had any evidence of that. Obviously, there's a limited scope in terms of what what the data shows. Um, but to me, this is providing a unique, it's unique evidence of a major influx of slavery derived capital uh, to Great Britain. On to our first uh, island, you know, Jamaica, uh, of course, is, you know, one of the major ones. Uh, and 45,000 Scots are there in 1774. This is compared to Scots are about, that's, we think that's a third of white society uh, in Jamaica. So that's compared to about Scots are 10% of the British population. So they're overrepresented. We know that they operate in clannish networks, the work of Callas and Hamilton. We also know that they're sojourners. They go there to earn quick money uh, and they come back. But the historians pre the book that I wrote, you know, Caras in particular had argued that there was a limited repatriation of wealth. Working through the, the Welsh Testaments and inventories has shown to me that there is a major repatriation of fortunes in the 19th century. William Ray is the big example here. Uh, and we can see he leaves 76,000, uh, which is, is huge. Um, we think 100k would be a nationally significant fortune, according to the work of William Rubinstein. So 76 is 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 up there. Um, we know Ray dies in 1837. Uh, we know it's the second largest identified estate that you know that I, I was able to identify. So it's very big, but it's instructive in itself. But there's a number of questions. Then how long was he in Jamaica? How did he earn the wealth? You know, how you know, how was it acquired? You know, what, what different commercial practices? Then we can start cross-referencing with some of the other material, in this case in Princeton, uh, New Jersey. We know uh, we can see here uh just this there was a case, an opinion around in his will. I mean, this is like gold dust. I spent you know a couple of weeks in Princeton in 2016, you know, just going through that these records and find detail. I don't think they exist, at least I haven't found any for, for other. Uh, that's just this provided the key. We know that he entered business in Kingston in the 1780s, 50 year in the island, which is a, a, a long lifespan considering the average lifespan of a white migrant to uh, Jamaica was about 12. We know he starts off as a merchant, becomes a coffee planter, and then an enslaver. Interestingly, he this case tells us that, that Scots were the only group that needed understanding of the triple systems uh, colonial, English, and Scots law, because Ray's insuring his will was written up with a codicil in the Scotch form. He wanted to ensure that his estate is disseminated uh, in England and Scotland. He 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 planned it all. He planned it all. So he, uh, what's interesting about him, he didn't want to leave. We know for the work of Caris and Hamilton that Scots are sojourners, um, but he wanted to stay. And I think the reason for that was family reasons. He had what's known as reputed children. Uh, I think it was a daughter with an enslaved woman, or you, you know, they're known as reputed children. These are the terms. Um, but in some in this case here, there was a wee degree of humanity from him that that it was unusual. You only need you need these legal opinions to get the you know the much more quality of information. Uh, and you can see here, um, this woman was on his way, seems to be dying. And he said, I wish I'd done more for my daughter. Uh, and he also called, I am dying, send for Campbell, which apparently was his solicitor. So actually, could th this source could take us into Ray and his, his deathbed. But into Grenada, you know, Grenada, as I've mentioned, as a second phase island, it is subsumed by the British after the Treaty of Paris in 1763. Of course, these are uh, new territory for Scots after the Union in 1707. And again, we can see that they're disproportionately overrepresented in terms of land purchases, according to the historian David Hancock. There is a rebellion in the 1790s, the Fedon Revolution, rebellion, whatever you want to describe it as, and there's a rebuilding there. Many Scots uh, are involved. We also know that they're inv by the 1830s, there is a Scots Kirk, uh, and I was able to look at some of the pure records and show that some of the Scots were, you know, I think they're between a third uh, and a half a, a, a grenade and white society. And you can see some of the remnants of the Scottish plantations is, 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 is here. The outstanding fortune, Scottish fortune, is a James Buchanan uh, of Moray Place, Edinburgh. He's actually a Glaswegian, and I'll come on to that in a minute. But he leaves this fortune 124k, which is, is huge. He's living in Edinburgh's new town, designed by James Gillespie Graham. 
But in his trust deed, it was really unusual and that he talks about to given large sums of money to relations is oftentimes attended with mischievous results. So if his family thought they were going to get the money, they were disappointed because he left it uh, elsewhere. Uh, what we can then do is start plugging in some of the hagiographical accounts of institutions that he actually funded, including this one, the top right, the Buchanan Institution. We know that his social background was relatively modest. He was the son of a farrier at the Tron Gate. He got an introduction to the Glasgow West India merchants uh, and departed uh, for the West Indies. He was in three separate slavery societies, Grenada, he goes on to Jamaica and Brazil. It was really, there was no way for me to decipher where the majority of the money came from. I could just say that it was slavery derived in three separate firms uh, and across these societies. Retired age 33, but he leaves major slavery derived philanthropy in the city of Glasgow via the Merchant's House, which is one of the major distributors of slavery derived capital in the city and probably Scotland. Trades House, Royal Infirmary, and he also establishes an industrial school, uh, the Buchanan Institution, as we can see here. Uh, and to me, I, I, so the book told us that the Buchanan's boys, as they became known, they were written to be heavier, healthier, and stronger than the average Glasgow schoolboy. That is remarkable. To me, into the Victorian period, Caribbean slavery was improving the lives uh, of children in a lower rank. You know, it was literally, Caribbean sl slavery was literally feeding the poor of Glasgow. And this is how he's memorialised inside the merchant's house up to fairly recently, this marble uh, bust. On to Trinidad, you know, Trinidad, as I mentioned, is a third-faced colony. Um, took for the Spanish in 1797, ceded uh, Britain in 1802. It's frontier, as it's been called by the historian Kit Candlin. Scots are a prominent, um, they're very small compared to, in terms of absolute numbers, compared to um, Jamaica, and they're much smaller in relative terms compared to the high proportion in Grenada, but they're still a very prominent group. The major fortune is a John Lamont, uh, and again, he leaves about 76k, similar to, to Ray, but the case here shows the limitations of using confirmation inventories because with heritable property, uh, one estimate says, suggests it was worth 148k, and that's a huge differential. He had invested in land, and he had the Trinidad plantations, etc., and they passed his family. And again, we can see here uh, his inventory. Some of the so again, I, I can show you how I started to plug in some of the, the other sources. I mean, there was a court case of John Lamont. We know he was the son of a, uh, a gentry, uh, James Lamont in Nocdo. But his mother was apparently, uh, there's a court case over John Lamont's fortune uh, and inheritance tax when he dies. And this went back into his social background and his story for leaving Argyle to go to Trinidad. His mother was apparently a woman of inferior station uh, and the, the laird. So we think John Lamont goes, uh, travels to Trinidad around 1802. And of course, this is an important year because the PC army ends had formally ceded Trinidad to Great Britain. Yeah, and we think this is his father um, here. Some of the other sources I discovered then, we could start plugging them in. We know the major fortune is there. John Lamont doesn't seem to be, at least he's not very well, he doesn't seem to have high education. He doesn't write stuff, for example. He doesn't write any books. But he does testify before a parliamentary committee in Trinidad. And we do get an understanding you know, of his rise. He became an overseer. He was an attorney managing estates and enslaved people. He also became a resident planter and owner of enslaved people. And we know his estate was was Cedar Grove um, in Naparima. I think he was probably had some connection with Eccles, merchant firm. Um, but, you, you know, he was, he, I can't work out how he got a major access to credit, but he certainly required that. We can start triangulating that with uh, other accounts. And there's a Maria Jones, an enslaved woman, who was probably supervised by Lamont at some point. Her account is written up by the church in 1851. And she is very complimentary towards him. Uh, other accounts are different. The other records in the National Archives, the Colonial Office records, he was accused of sexual abuse in Trinidad. The, the local authorities exonerated him, but there were social implications of that. The local militia refused to serve him in the 1820s, for example. 
We also know that he is memorialised very sympathetically by his direct uh, descendant, Norman Lamont, who actually goes to Trinidad. Uh, uh, he's actually killed in Trinidad, I think, in the 1940s. He's gored by a bull uh, in Naparima. Um, but he delivers a, he seems to have had access to sources about Lamont and he writes up this antiquarian publication that, that really helped me fill in some of the, the blanks. <laughs> but I mentioned that John Lamont was ostracised for his gentry family when he leaves Argyle. His brothers then get in touch when he becomes wealthy. So they then go to Trinidad. And again, we can go to Scotland's people here. Boyden Lamont, we know he arrives uh, in Trinidad in 1817. He goes back to Scotland and he writes up his uh, will and testament, or at least he has it written up. We know that Boyden Lamont then is back in Trinidad when he claims compensation in 1836. Uh, and when he dies, which again, we've got solid evidence of this through Scotland's people and through the confirmation inventory, he's worth 26k. So I speculated a little that, I mean, probably this was was 20k profits in 20 years, you know, that would be a, a, a remarkable rate of return, if not on the level of John Lamont's. But I mentioned that Scots are typically sojourners. Uh, Lamont is, John Lamont, I should say, is different. Uh, he sees himself, and there's writing in the court case, he talks about himself as he wanted to die in harness. He had become a permanent colonial resident, just like William Ray. And I think it was because he's lower social rank in Scotland. He was illegitimate. You know, I think he got much more status in Trinidad. Uh, and actually, I think he just liked life better. He appoints an attorney, uh, but he remains a permanent resident of Trinidad and a resident planter. He does purchase Benmore House, um, which is at the core of Benmore Botanical Gardens today, but he never visits. Uh, uh, he does visit, sorry, but he doesn't move there permanently. He does have a very uh, well-established transmission strategy, and we can see that through, you know, it goes to, ironically, it goes to his elite family. Uh, the Gentry family, the Lamonts uh, of, of not do through James Lamont to Norman Lamont and then Augusta Lamont. And you can see up the top right here, you can see his obituary when he died in 1850. And we can see him in Boyden Lamont's gravestone here when uh, that's still there in South Naparima today. Interestingly, uh, the line died out of these Lamonts in 1850 with Augusta. She bequeathed her estate to the Church of Scotland uh, it was valued recently at 5.5 million. Uh, and apparently the Church of Scotland have intimated that they will apologise for their historic connections to slavery. Um, and that'll be including the John Lamont fortune. And now we know that, we can trace that, we know where it comes from, and we know, we know where it lies uh, in the Church of Scotland's estate today. So I think overall here, um, you know, this is what Scotland's people allows us to do. We can have an assessment of wealth levels. We've got 138 Scottish West India fortunes. It's the largest sample in the historiography. We have associated wills and testaments, uh, and we know that there's a, a grand total of 1.044 million. On average, they would have left with 7,569. 7, In today's terms, that's huge. 6.76 million. I mean, this is huge. I think there's obviously high levels of absenteeism, but the story is the majority of these Scots would have died in the West Indies. Very few of them would have reached 100k, and most were relatively poorer. But even £200 in 1825 is the equivalent to 177 in modern values. I think the conclusion here, the majority of the Scots who went to the West Indies died there. A minority became wealthy, even fewer became very rich, but the cumulative effects of the repatriation of capital was enormous, especially in the 1820s. And another thing that allows us to do with this analysis is a regional analysis. <laughs> Again, we've got this 1.044 million. I split that up. They, they confirmed, I examined the major fortunes and then looked at the wills and testaments, where the money was going, You know, where was it repatriated to. Um, Western Lowlands, of course, receives the most, and I think that that fits with, you know, the outward data that are provided through the, the shipping registers. I think what to look at here is, is the Scottish Highland experiences. 
disproportionately high numbers of young men went out for the Highlands, at least according to the ship, the very few ship registers we have. But very few, as we can see here, albeit large-scale fortunes returned. To me, this made sense. If we're in the era of the clearances, if these Highland Scots were leaving, um, you know, why would they want to come back? What would they be coming back to? Then we can compare with the work of David Alston, you know, Douglas Hamilton and Carly Keogh. There's, there's some interesting comparisons uh, here that we can make. But this level of detail is only possible, for, firstly, because they're, they're digitised and, you know, just the long time spent and, you, you know, really analysing how much money was earned uh, and where did it go. I think summary, and I'm in, I'm in good timing here. Um, firstly, you can see here, you know, I spent some time in St Andrews, Scots Kirk, uh, in Kingston, in Jamaica in 2014, and it's remarkable to see, you know, so many memorials to Scots uh, still in Jamaica um, today, and it sums it up. I mean, Scots are all over every island I went to. There's a Scots Kirk in Jamaica, there's a Scots Kirk in Trinidad, uh, and there's a Scots Kirk in Grenada too. The one in Jamaica is still standing. Um, Grenada is was destroyed by Hurricane Ivan in 2004 and Trinidad's is, is still, the Greyfriars was sort of semi, semi destroyed. But I mean, these are the legacies of Scots um, today. But we are looking at a model of repatriated sojourning profits that facilitates, as I've mentioned, this regional analysis of repatriation. You know, how much money did they earn? Where did it go? And it allows these cursory conclusion and transmission strategies. The work of Carly Keo has provided a model in terms of you know, philanthropic contributions or to family and kin. I think the bigger sample has shown it probably the most money went uh to families, I think. Uh certainly in central Scotland, West and East Central Scotland. Ten percent went in the industry, which is not a huge figure, but it's not um insubstantial. Particularly railways, some of the money. We know that 25% of my sample also owned heritable property, particularly 10% owning landed estates. It could have been a, a significant influx in the industrial, eh, sorry, agricultural revolution too. But I think overall, you know, so German capital is important to central Scotland. And I think relatively few returns to the Scottish Highlands. And I think that has been a surprise for some because, you know, the work of David Alston and Slaves and Highlanders, people are thinking, you know, the return sojourning capital is central to the development of the Scottish Highlands. I, I, I don't see it that way, or at least, the you know, the data doesn't support it. So me overall, Caribbean sojourning, uh, and by extension, chattel slavery, it improved some areas of Scotland, but it perpetuates the underdevelopment elsewhere, and I'm contrasting central Scotland particularly uh, with the Highlands. So thank you much, thank you very much for listening, uh, and you can purchase or download the book free here. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, we'll now stop the recording of the talk.